Thank you everyone for joining me today. My name is Mark Enriquez. I'm a partner with Womble Bond Dickinson. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about managing legal spend in 2020. This is a topic uh, that has been around for a while in terms of the need to manage legal spend, but I believe we are in a unique circumstance with a combination of COVID and the new changes in the legal marketplace that I thought it'd be appropriate to review some issues around managing legal spend. So I'm excited that you could join us today. I also wanna have a dialogue. We'll have some polling questions as we go through, uh, but there's also a Q&A box and um, well, I'll certainly leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. I, I may try to deal with those as we go. So um, please feel free to use that Q&A box. Um, in looking at the participant list, I was excited. We've got about 100 uh, people registered to attend, which is a lot of our in-house counsel in Charlotte. I'm sorry we can't meet in person. I always enjoy the, uh, the chance to grab a drink and catch up in person. So we're stuck with WebEx, which is the next best thing. Uh, but let me start by saying I hope you're staying healthy, uh, that your family are doing well. I know this is a challenging time, both professionally but also personally. Uh, for a lot of people and we're going through a lot of adjustments so um so i hope everyone is doing well and i'm glad uh, that you could join me today now you may be wondering why should i listen to a lawyer at a large law firm talk about managing legal spend i mean you know aren't you guys the problem you've got high rates you've got these big matters we spend a lot of money um and you it you know isn't your interest in trying to make legal spend even higher um, and, and, I, and I'll submit that that's not really what we're after. And, and let me be clear, uh, law firms wanna make a profit, lawyers wanna make a profit, um, and, and there's certainly an economic incentive. In fact, I'm gonna spend some time today talking about just how that incentive comes into play. But, but I will say beyond that, I think good law firms and good lawyers really wanna be in partnership with clients. We wanna get a fair profit, but we also want the company to be successful. We want you as in-house counsel to be successful. And I actually think the way to work on managing legal spend is to foster a more cooperative rather than competitive um, environment between in-house counsel and outside counsel. And I'm gonna talk about some ways I think you can do that, both in terms of the structure of the arrangement and, and the nature of the relationship. And, and I think that there is a lot of real savings there. Um, and you may be also saying, well, what, you know, Mark, um, it, you know, it's great. I know you've been in practice for a while, um, but what do you know about in-house uh, practice? And I have never served as an in-house counsel. All 30 years uh, of my career have been at Womble Bond Dickinson, uh, where I do business, commercial, and construction litigation. However, I have spent a lot of time talking uh, to in-house counsel. As some of you know, and I think some on the call have actually been guests on my podcast, the in-house roundhouse. Um, over the last three years, I've interviewed over 60 in-house counsel uh, from all over the country, not just here in Charlotte. Uh, as some of you know, we were on the floor of the ACC and recorded live there last year. Uh, but a lot of those podcasts have really focused on the relationship between inside counsel and outside counsel, and specifically around how to manage that relationship, how to minimize legal spend. So. You know what? I have had a lot of time talking uh, to folks on those those issues. Um, if you're interested in the podcast, I'm proud to announce we just got picked up by Spotify. Uh, so if that's your favorite platform, you can look for in-house roundhouse there. Uh, we are also in iTunes and Android Play and SoundCloud. And if you go to our website, WombleBondDickinson.com, you can see the podcast. And again, you don't have to listen to all 60. You can scroll through and find one that might be a particular interest to you. And if you're interested in being a guest, just contact me after after the podcast. But I think I've really enjoyed doing those podcasts and talking to folks. I also host our firm's uh, GC Roundtable series where we bring together uh, general counsel um, from uh, certain industry sectors like the manufacturing sector and just talk about current issues. So I feel privileged to have spent a lot of time talking to in-house lawyers, even though I've never been one. And I think I have an understanding of some of those pressures. Um, so let, let's go ahead and dig in and let's talk about what we're going to cover uh, today. You know, I think we're going to start uh, by busting some myths. Why? I think there's some perception about you can, there's a few easy things to do and you snap your fingers and, uh, and legal spend comes under control. And, and I disagree with that. And I'll tell you why. Um, I want to talk a bit about the implications of COVID. I do serve as co-chair of Womble's 
uh, COVID Task Force, and we've done a number of webinars specific to COVID. I do think this is a unique time that presents some unusual challenges around managing legal spend and around managing legal relationships. I want to talk about that in the context of spend and give you some suggestions for how uh, to manage spend better now, today, in the time of COVID. Then I want to turn to what I think really works. What are the core uh, elements of uh, a good way to manage legal spend? I want to talk about moving beyond the billable hour uh, to alternative fee arrangements. Those have been around for a long time. We've seen a real uptick in their use. And I want to explore how that can be an effective tool in your toolbox for doing it. And then at the end, I'm going to give you some examples of cost saving engagements that we've actually used at Womble uh, in a variety of contexts. Uh, to give you an idea of the kind of things you may want to do uh, at your firm, at your business, and with your outside counsel. Again, a lot of this, this, this is not unique to Womble. You can apply what you're going to learn here to whoever you're using uh, as counsel. But I do want to give you some practical insight into terms we've seen uh, where clients have said, yeah, we actually saved money uh, and we actually were able to, to improve it. So that's what we're going to do. And again, I wish we were in person and I could call on people. Um, but since we can't do that, uh, I do encourage you to submit uh, questions in your Q&A box and we can try to have that at least virtual chat. Let's talk about some myths. Um, and, and the first is, you know, e-billing software. Um, you know, when I Google managing legal spend, I get a bunch of ads for e-billing software. Um, everyone is promising to save you a lot of money um, and uh, cut down outside counsel spend and eliminate items. And, and sometimes that may be effective. Uh, I'd be interested in getting your perspectives on how effective it is. I, I can share my perspective as an outside counsel. And I think, uh, let me say at the outset, the idea of electronic bill submission is something I'm totally in favor of. Right, we, we do still sometimes mail out bills, but it's almost all electronic. And if you've got a lot of bills using some kind of automated e-billing software to track and receive invoices and organize stuff by matter and set up automated review, all that makes a lot of sense, right? Big companies are all using some kind of e-billing software. So I'm not opposed um, to, to e-billing software to streamline the billing process, improve efficiency. I think the false promise around e-billing software is that somehow you're going to be able to code out a lot of your expenses. And that's what they promise. They say, well, our software will scan the lawyer's bill and identify stuff you shouldn't be charged for. But when you actually dig into what they're looking at, a lot of it is stuff that I think is foolish not to pay for. For example, many claim to be able to screen out um, any internal law firm conferences. So they'll find out that, oh, it looks like Mark Henriquez was meeting with Matthew Tilly uh, and they both build time to the same issue on the same day. Therefore, they must have been meeting to talk about it and therefore you shouldn't pay. And I have to say, um, as outside counsel, I think that's silly. And, I, 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 and I've been doing this a long time. Oftentimes those internal conferences, now unfortunately they've got to be virtual most of the time, are the highest value work we do as your lawyers. When we sit down and have a two hour meeting to talk about our strategy for summary judgment or grounds for our motion to dismiss, we are building the core of the case. We are bringing the best legal minds working on the team and saying, what is our strategy? How do we achieve this objective? What is our best approach? That's high value work. That's where the cases are won and lost. Um, one reason you wanna use good lawyers and in particular good law firms with lots of smart lawyers is to have that think tank mentality of we're gonna to get together and figure out how to win your case. Um, but a billing software that says you can't charge for any of those conferences undermines that fundamental value. And, and I think it's false savings to say, oh, well, we're gonna ding, you can't bill more than one timekeeper. So Mr. Tilly and Mr. Ingersoll, we're not gonna charge, uh, you can't charge us for their time because they were meeting with you. Um, and, and creative lawyers and law firms can find other ways to bill that time and just talk about it as doing strategy analysis or case assessment, but you end up in word games around, is it really a conference? Or are you working on case strategy? That's not how you want your lawyer spending time. Your lawyer should be focused on the actual core issues. The other false promise that I see in e-billing software is this idea that somehow by identifying charges, you can automatically exclude a bunch of them. Um, 
and again, as someone, I, I, I do a lot of the billing, you know, for my matter. So I do spend hours every week reviewing bills. Um, I'm also in the process for Womble, I'm the write down approver. So not only do I review my own bills, but for the entire business for around the firm, I have to review and approve uh, write down. So I see an awful lot of legal bills. Um, I don't think there's any easy mechanistic way to identify um, excess time. And I'm not saying time shouldn't be written down. Uh, time is routinely written down. Sometimes tasks take longer than they should. Sometimes there's poor coordination. Sometimes you lose a team member and bring someone on. Um, and I will say, I think good firms, and certainly we view our job as trying to identify that non-productive time and remove it from the bill before you even see it or mark it as a no charge. But I'm totally fine with, uh, I think you've got an obligation to review those bills and also identify wasteful time. My concern is that a computer can't do that for you. Uh, no, no software I've seen is going to be able to identify something as unproductive. And those that build themselves as having standards, so they'll be able to tell you, aha, you know, this motion took more than four hours and therefore excessive. I, I, I just don't believe it. At least in the complex work we're doing, there is no chart where you can look up and find, ah, well, you know, a motion to dismiss a class action should only take 100 hours uh, and you can apply it. It just doesn't work that way uh, in, in the real world. So let's transition from billing software to outside council guidelines. And I'm curious how many of you use them. Uh, Jordan, if we can put up our first poll. Um, I, I've got a poll that simply asks whether you use outside council guidelines or not. Um, I, I will say maybe five, eight years ago, um, this was a really popular um, issue where a lot of people were saying, hey, this is the secret. To managing legal spend, simply adopt these guidelines. And you could go, I think the ACC had a panel uh, years ago uh, at one of the national meetings I attended where it was all about, you know, outside counsel guidelines and how they can save you money. So, um, you know, we've got, what, a, we, we, what, what do we have? We've got, um, you know, 75 people uh, here. If you want to pop in uh, your answer on that, um, we'll close that poll in just a minute and get the results. So. While you're finishing that, I want to be clear again that I'm not opposed to outside counsel guidelines. I think they can be useful to establish basic rules about, you know, how you're going to cover travel reimbursement, how you're going to treat travel time. Um, you know, if you've got rules about getting approval before you have more than one person attend a deposition or more than one person attend a hearing. I think those can be reasonable and they promote discussion and they can set out your company expectations. So. I am not opposed in principle to outside guidelines. I've used the word rigid for a reason um, because I think it's the really complex outside council guidelines that I think are not cost effective and really create burden um, on your council. Let's go ahead and close that poll, Jordan, if we can and see what our results are. Um, I think this started in the insurance industry and I still work, do occasionally see stuff from insurance companies where they will issue 30 page, 40 page outside guidelines. And it is absolutely a maze. Everything's gotta be um, coded a certain way. You can't use certain descriptors. You've gotta do this other stuff. It creates an enormous burden on your law firm to try to comply with the guidelines. And sometimes they are used simply as a trap to try to catch lawyers using the wrong code or violating um, some other guideline to write the time off. And I think some of that savings is artificial. It may be that you can say, aha, Mark, you, you, if you look at the subtext of our guidelines here, it says that if you travel more than 50 miles, you've got to get pre-approval and you drove 80 miles to go to the courthouse uh, in Greensboro. And therefore, um, you know, we're going to exclude that reimbursement expense or reduce your travel time or, uh, or other stuff. And I may say, okay, you may save, um, you know, $100 on that bill. But as outside counsel, I'm going to say, look, this is, this is kind of crazy, right? Why, um, why do we need to be so focused on uh, the minutia of billing codes? And it forces me to have uh, a paralegal or, or someone else actually going through and trying to make sure we understand the guidelines. We have a lot of non-billable time working around compliance. Um, and, and I think it's generally uh, generally unproductive 
uh, to do that. So I, I think those can often be counterproductive. Again, short guidelines, give me a couple of pages with your philosophy on billing or things that you are problematic for you and your company. Um, I'm happy to review that even better. We can talk about it. And so I can understand uh, what those uh, pressure points are for you. I, I'm in favor of that. But don't give me a book of 30, 40 pages and expect me to understand it as a billing attorney or pay somebody you know, off the clock to try to go through and analyze it and, and, and conform. I think it's just an extra burden. And it, it even more importantly, it sends a message that you don't trust me to bill fairly, uh, that you don't trust the kind of work I'm doing and that it's gonna be um, you know, really closely scrutinized. So I think that, you know, that can be problematic. Um, Jordan, is it possible to show, I don't know if we closed that poll, to show what those, uh, what the polling results are? I'm interested in how many people use them. All right. It looks like we've got a, a two to one majority of people using it, 23 yeses, uh, 11 noes, and 36 that, that are uh, still waking up or maybe not sure of, of what their answer is, which is, which is fine. Um, that's interesting to me. And again, I think that that is indicative of the fact that they have become more popular. And I, in my experience, it depends a lot on the size of your, of your company. Um, let's switch to billing codes. And while we're doing that, Jordan, I do have another, another poll around review of bills that kind of relates to that. So if we could go ahead and submit our next poll while I talk about billing codes. Um, this is kind of connected to the guidelines. Um, and again, I use the word overuse because I'm not opposed to the basic concept of some kind of activity code. As you know, the ABA years ago published a list of standard activity codes. I find those can be useful, particularly in connection with budget tracking, right? If, I'm, if I've got a budget and I've got a component for discovery or for depositions and motions and correspondence and other pieces, doing that coding lets me track more specifically uh, against budget. So the idea of doing some coding on time um, is fine and, and doing billing codes is good. And I think it can be a useful communication tool, right? Because you get to see visually um, how much time is spent doing specific tasks. So billing coding can be useful. I think it often, uh, again, becomes a trap for lawyers. And what where I find it frustrating is, um, again, if you're not using the ABA coding, if you've developed your own customized codes and now expect every timekeeper to learn how your particular coding system works, it creates a real burden on your, on your law firm. And what's even more frustrating as outside counsel is to do work that clearly is appropriate work and it gets rejected because um, either I or my assistant clicked the wrong billing code. And so we coded something that was actually working on a brief and coded it as research or vice versa, or, or said, you know, we we're doing research on the brief, but now we've triggered some rule that says if we spent more than three hours researching, uh, we have to get approval. Again, I think these developed in the, uh, particularly around the uh, insurance defense area, where the idea was you're hiring people to defend um, car accident cases, you don't need a lot of research. So you can set up tabs to say, you shouldn't be really act researching auto accident negligence for more than two hours. I think some, what, what bothers me is some large companies have said, oh, those look really detailed. They take these very elaborate billing codes on very specific triggers. Um, and, and that can be challenging in other contexts, particularly larger firm contexts, so, um, which I appreciate. Um, let's see, it, it looks like, let me look, Noel, thank you. Noel Sproul's added a question. Let me read it out, which I, which I appreciate. So um, Noel's question is, she says, the challenge with what I'm saying is that many outside counsels that we law firms have agreed to say you aren't billing for those internal meetings. And, and I think that is, um, that's a good point. And I do see that provision in a lot of, um, of outside counsel uh, guidelines. Now, I agree in the, in the perfect world, what, what we would do, and I've done this occasionally, is said, we're not going to agree to that guideline um, because I don't think it reflects uh, the value of the work that we are doing. But I think you put your law firms in uh, a difficult position if you are asking them to not bill for any internal communications to either say that's unreasonable or 
um, to do it. And I, again, I think the goal of guidelines should be to encourage more efficient and more productive work. And I really challenge the assumption that internal conferences are are not um, are not efficient. So my my suggestion is that those guidelines be more of a discussion. Uh, and more cooperative rather than do it and then uh, use that as a way um, to, to reduce guidelines. I'd rather have an upfront discussion. If, if you're using that as a tool you know, to cut time, I'd rather talk about a discount or identify other areas. Uh, I, do, I say that because I think those internal conferences are often um, useful. So, and, and, no, and Noelle makes another great point, and I think this is true. Um, uh, she says, you know, disconnect is lawyers are doing the work um, don't do what the outside council guidelines say. And so um, they're not following them. And so you get uh, screening um, to see what is billed. So, uh, and, and, and your example is one that I think is worth talking about, which is block billing. Um, two points there. I agree. I think you often get problems with compliance with uh, billing guidelines, um, and particularly the ones that are really lengthy and long. And that's because you have an issue around who is going to implement and enforce that. And I think the practical issue is um, a lot of lawyers are focused on doing uh, active billable work for, for clients. And so they're not gonna, if I'm the billing partner on the case, it's difficult for me to spend a number of hours studying the billing guidelines and making sure they're implemented, particularly if they're long and complex. So I'm more likely to delegate that uh, responsibility to an assistant or a paralegal or an associate and say, can you review those? Um, and so that's where you get, you, you may get some uh, disjoint between that. Now, as a billing attorney, I should be reviewing those bills to make sure they comply with the guidelines. Um, and obviously lawyers will learn. So if, if we do block billing and the guidelines don't allow it and we submit it and you say, we don't allow block billing, you know, I'll, I'll learn that and we'll get it corrected. And I think block billing can often be abused. So I, I'm not an opponent of itemization of time. I think an eight hour block that just lists what's doing doesn't give you good information as a client about how the time was spent. Um, and I've tried to get in the habit of even where there's no prohibition on block billing, putting in next to each entry um, the work I've done. I will say what I find is time consuming uh, for me is you know if you not only let me do an entry that indicates the time spent on each item but if i've done work in six different categories you know breaking that out and coding each of those activities for the day into different areas so if i've got you know correspondence with outside counsel is 0.2 hours here but um you know communication with the courts a different code so that's 0.2 hours here you're spending um a lot of time as lawyers working on your billing entries. Uh, and again, assistance can help with that, but I think that that's often um, not uh, the most helpful and not the best use of my time as a partner working on, on the case to spend a lot of time breaking out those time entries. So I think, and I think if I just put the amount of time on each item, I'm communicating what I'm working on. Um, so I, I think Again, I think there's a balance, and as I'll talk about in a minute, I think the communication piece is where a lot of that value ends. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of the value comes from the communication piece, and I think there are better ways to do that than really long guidelines. Um, and Andrew Walsh, uh, and I'm not sure if everyone can see the questions, but I appreciate the comment here, um, you know, talks about the need to have flexible uh, implementation. And, and I, you know, I agree that if you're flexible and it's a discussion point, I think you get the value. Let's see what those polling results are, Jordan, in terms of who reviews it, because I think this is where I see a real uh, difference in approach by a lot of our, our, our in-house counsel uh, is who's reviewing it. So the poll says uh, the number one answer is in-house attorney. So that's you guys <laughs> reviewing the bills. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I try to write my, my billing entries and, teach and train my associates uh, and paralegals on this you know, to write it in a way that explains to you as the attorney that hired us what we're doing for the matter and importantly, how we're adding value, right? I, I will say, you know, we do training of new associates every year on how to do bills. And I have to stress, you know, this is not a journal. This is not your opportunity to, to list everything you did that day. 
Um, the focus is on what you were doing for the case and how you added value and an accurate, thorough description of what you've done. So not just a research period, five hours, but explain what issues you were looking at, what specifically, why you were doing the research, because you're going to be looking at it. Um, I see a few of you use in-house paralegals, um, but then, and then some of you use other in-house in staff. Um, and again, I know your time's valuable, so you've always got this trade-off of who's going to be doing the review. I know only one in our group is using outside reviewers. I will say some of my most frustrating experiences as a billing attorney are uh, do come from outside reviewers that don't know anything about the case, but they've hired these folks um, and are paying them to scrutinize our bills and come back and say, you know, there's a mismatch here where Mark said he met with Matthew on this day or made this call but the, you know, the call seems to be on a different date. Or again, what I view as a lot of nitpicky stuff for someone that doesn't know anything about the case. And again, you're focusing on working on making sure the bill complies with some guideline rather than it being used as an effective uh, communication tool. All right, one other myth, and then we're gonna move on uh, to some things that I think are more productive. Um, there is, I think some people for a while were saying blended rates are the answer to everything. You know, we can, we can do a blended rate. And for those of you that haven't used it, that's where if my rate's 500 and my associate's rate is 250, you know, you can blend those and maybe we'll give you a 350 blended rate. And you're like, wow, this is a great deal. You know, we're getting market 350 an hour. Um, the reason I don't think they're often that effective is they really distort um, the, the incentives uh, for billing. So if I'm only getting 350 uh, as part of a blended rate, that is going to be hurting my realization, which is one of the measures that's used to govern my productivity as a partner. Um, it's going to also be helping my associate's realization, right? Because he probably isn't getting 350 uh, on most of his other matters. So he has an incentive to do even more work on this case relative to other cases. I have an incentive to do less work on this case relative than other cases. Um, and maybe that's a good thing, right? We do want to push work down to the lowest available person, right? You don't want me doing work my associate can be doing at half the rate. Um, on the other hand, I think it distorts the normal incentive to have the right person doing the job by basically saying, Mark, if you spend time on this case, you're only going to get a fraction of what you would usually get. So I, I, and I've talked to a number of in-house counsel. I think by and large, blended rates don't really a result in, in significant savings. So I'm not sure uh, that they're really often that effective of a tool. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about COVID and then we'll shift to what things I think work, again, from the perspective of an outside, uh, outside lawyer. Um, we are in a uniquely challenging time, right? We've never seen anything like this pandemic, at least in our lifetime. And, and I do think, the, the, let me state first the obvious first, which is I know you guys are experiencing real pressure on your budget, right? Cash is king. Everyone's worried about money. Um, we understand that. Law firms are worried about cash flow as well. So this is a uniquely challenging time from that perspective. You know, legal budgets were already tight. You guys are being forced to do more and more with less money. Now, since law firms are, you know, legal departments are not usually viewed as a revenue generating department. Um, and again, some of you have gotten creative about ways to show you really do add uh, revenue, but there's a lot of pressure uh, on keeping costs down. And, and I will say, you know, for the clients we're partnering with, we hear that, we understand that, we want to work to try to to help you meet your goals. I, I, I believe strongly uh, in a partnership model. If, if you're not successful as an in-house counsel, um, you know, we're not gonna be happy as your outside counsel. So I, I think teamwork's important and we are trying to team with clients at this challenging time. I also think beyond that, just upfront budget pressure of, hey, you've got to do more with less. I think COVID does create two other unique challenges. And it's really a challenge for you, but also for us. Um, and the first is simple communication challenges, right? We don't have the face-to-face -face interactions. And um, we can try to do things like this webinar, but it's not as good as us getting together at, at Byron South End and chatting uh, over a glass of wine or sitting next to each other at lunch. It just doesn't work as well. Um, and so that's challenging. And I also think it creates barriers to trust, right? One of the ways we build trust is sitting down with clients in a room and saying, I understand your problem. Let me figure out what your needs and objectives are. We can do that 
virtually. We can do it on a phone call or even better, a video call, but it's still not the same. And I think that is a real challenge. It is harder uh, to communicate clearly uh, if you're not meeting in face to face. It's harder to build rapport and build trust. And that is a major challenge. Now, many of us, you know, have what I call a carryover benefit. I mean, I spent a lot of time working with the lawyers on my team. So we have a lot of trust. And now we can talk via video or chat on Jabber. And I still feel uh, that connection. But I worry as the months go by, I think that reserve of trust uh, begins to drop because you just haven't had that personal interaction. And I think it's even more challenging if you're working with new people. If you've hired new lawyers or you've got new management and you've never had that face-to-face -face trust building, it really is, uh, it's a challenge that is especially difficult in COVID. And um, that is a challenge. And I think it's worth just putting it up front and recognizing it. That, and we talk and we can talk about ways to overcome it, but I think it is real. The other is related, but to me a little different because it's more of a tactical logistic concern and that is coordination. Um, I'm finding it harder to monitor workloads of the other people on my team. You know, I used to walk by their office and I'd get coffee and make a point to walk by my team members and say, hey, Mike, how, how are things going? What you working on today? Um, do you need more to do? Are you overloaded? Um, they'd walk by my office and say, hey, I just want to let you know I got this new brief in from another partner and we're going to be crunched or, hey, I'm a little slow right now. Um, that is much, much harder to do now. Now, in theory, we could do that via chat or just do a check-in. I do think we are making efforts to do daily, weekly, uh, regular check-ins with team members to try to accomplish some of that, but it is hard. I and mean, it takes a lot more conscious effort to monitor workloads. And I think that's a challenge. And I expect it's a challenge for you too, um, managing your in-house teams and the other people that are reporting to you. It's just harder when you're not there walking by as part of your routine. The other thing that I think is an issue uh, for you and us is quality control, right? We just don't have the same level of uh, checking in, automatically seeing everything. So we have to be extra diligent in terms of review of work product, in terms of review of communications uh, with clients. It's harder now to get on a joint phone call potentially because we're not next door uh, and just talking about it. Um, everything becomes more forced and even feedback if you have issues around performance, um, it's much more challenging to do that in a virtual environment as opposed to taking someone to lunch or buying them a beer or sitting down in their office and saying, you know, here's here's what you did on this brief. Here's what I'd like to see. Again, it can be done virtually, but it's harder. And I think all of those mean we need to be extra careful uh, to make sure we're doing quality work, to make sure we're clearly communicating objectives. And I think communication between inside and outside counsel is even more paramount in this environment. So. Um, so I think that, you know, that is, that is a real challenge unique, unique to COVID. All right, let's, let's switch over and talk about some things that make a, a real difference. And actually, Jordan, if you could put up our final polling uh, question, which uh, involves alternative fee arrangements, we're going to talk about that at the end. So we'll give people an opportunity to answer on that. And again, uh, this polling question just asks what percentage of your spend is not based on hourly rate, so some kind of alternative uh, fee arrangement. So what makes a difference from my perspective as an outside lawyer? Um, you know, I, I think budgets are really, really important. And you do have to have a candid, open discussion about how much the matter is going to cost um, and how much it's expected to cost. And I think that needs to take place early. Um, I'm a, again, I'm a litigator, but I'm a fan of developing budgets by phase. Um, it's very difficult if, if you come and say, Mark, we got sued in this class action. Um, take a look at the complaint. Let me know tomorrow how much it's going to cost to defend it. Yeah, that's going to be a hard question to answer. I can talk to you about how much it costs to defend the last five class actions, but everyone is different. And there's a huge range, right, from you know $100,000 to over a million dollars. So uh, I can't give you a easy quote, quote, price quote on defending a class action through trial. And, and I'm suspicious of lawyers that, that do. Um, and again, we've got internal data. I can talk to you about what numbers we're seeing, not just by personal experience, but as a firm. But the kind of uh, complex litigation I do is not easy 
uh, to just put a quote on. This is not drafting a standard will. Uh, this isn't even contract review, which we often do do on some flat basis. Litigation tends to be more complex. However, um, what I can do is probably give you a budget for the first phase of the case. I can say, look, I, I can tell you how long it'll take us to review this complaint, get an understanding of the facts, and prepare either an answer, counterclaim, dispositive motions, right? That first phase from, from complaint to the end, I can probably give you a pretty good estimate on how much that will cost, and we can develop a budget because I've done that a bunch of times. I know over the next month, I'm gonna have to be developing my own staffing uh, to figure that out. And I think having that discussion saying, okay, here's how I'm gonna staff it, here's how much it costs, we can do that up front. And, and I can then say, look, once we finish that, or as we get near that, the next phase is likely gonna be written discovery. And I can give you a budget for preparing our discovery to them and theirs to ours. Uh, we have to make some assumptions about what kind of document review we're gonna need and whether it's internal or external, but I can give you a written discovery budget as we get ready to file our answer and counterclaims. And similarly, if we're talking about depositions, somewhere during that written phase, we're also gonna be coming up with a schedule for depositions and I can say, I think we're probably gonna to need to take six depositions and I think they may also take six and here's my budget for depositions. Uh, and then as we get to motions, I can give you a, a budget for summary judgment motions. And then as we get near summary judgment, now trial has much more visibility because discovery is wrapping up. I understand what the issues are. I've got a good sense of how many witnesses. I've probably made some projection to the court as to how long trial will last. And now I can give you a budget for trial. So at least for big cases, I think that phase budget approach where I can tell you this is where I see the lawsuit going based on my experience and here's my budget um, can, can be great. And I think that does a couple of important things. It makes us have a discussion around cost. It reinforces to me, costs obviously matter. And there's often an opportunity to talk about ways to save money. Because you may say, look, I, don't, I didn't realize that depositions are gonna be so expensive. Is there a way we can get by with fewer depositions? And I may be able to say, yeah, I've recommended six because I think we got six people that would be great to talk to, but really three are key. And if we got budgetary constraints, you know, it, it, it may not be ideal, but I think we can get by with just taking three depositions. Or maybe you look at it and I say, you've only got a, you know, two in 10 chance of winning on summary judgment. You may say, well, that's not worth it, Mark. Let's not make the motion for summary judgment. You've given me your budget. It's gonna be expensive. We've got the other side responding. Um, let's just skip it. Let's just go to trial. It's not a, not a good enough return. Um, those are major cost savings, right? That's not denying a 0.2 entry uh, on my timesheet. That is reshifting how we manage the case based on your budgetary concerns and an active discussion about how important the case is. And obviously this takes place best if you also do an early case assessment where we both talk about how much is this case worth to you? What's your exposure? And what do we think initially our chances of success are, right? Because you're gonna handle the million dollar case differently than the $100,000 case, and you're gonna handle the million dollar case differently than the $20 million case. So I think getting a handle on the case assessment, what your exposure is, and then working together to come up with a strategy that maximizes your chance of success, but is also very conscious of your budgetary objectives really does result in significant um, cost savings. So that early discussion of cost and fees is very important and staffing is very important. Um, for those of you that have worked with me, you know I'm a fan of lean staffing. Even in complex cases, um, I don't know that I've ever personally staffed a case with more than four lawyers. My default mode is two, partner and associate. And I think we can handle a lot of cases with two lawyers and do a good job and then call in other resources at crunch time if we need it. Why are smaller teams better? I think that coordination is easier. We spend less time worrying about who's doing what piece and we simply divide it up based on who the effective timekeeper is. Um, it's gonna depend on the case. Again, really complex case, you may need four lawyers or three. Simple cases I've done by myself or handed it off to associate and just said, I'm going to provide supervision to make sure you're getting good quality, but this case does not worth the stakes. It's a $75,000 case. You don't want me um, working on it day to day. I'll provide the guidance and management, make sure everything's good. I'll be a resource, but I will either, you know, I'm only going to bill a small amount of time. 
So I think it should be tailored, but I'm a fan of smaller teams um, because I do think you can get inefficiency if you've got really large teams and anything other than the most major bet the company case. But staffing is a way and having that discussion early on staffing and figuring out who the right people are, what their rates are. I understand you're going to want to uh, negotiate rates and, and that's something uh, that we will do. But I think that is an opportunity um, to really have control. And then, you know, I think a long-term relationship is important. Um, and some of you have had long-term relationships with counsel, some with Womble, some with your counsel. Um, uh, I, I think if you've got a good relationship, there's a lot of value there. Because if both parties understand this is not a one-off, I think there's a significant incentive uh, for everyone to be reasonable. If you're a good client of the firm, or you and you and I have worked together for 10 years, uh, and you're upset about a bill, I'm much more inclined to say, don't worry about it. We're, I'll cut that bill in half, or I'll take that timekeeper off, or I'm sorry you're disappointed. And if you've got a relationship where you've been paying my bills regularly, and I know, um, you know that usually you don't have an issue with the bill, if you say, Mark, this entry seems out of whack, or I don't see the value here, I'm going to be very receptive to hearing that, because I know you know that this is not your usual course and we've done something wrong and similarly i think if you've used lawyers you're familiar with you've got that trust and established relationship to know they're gonna do quality work and you don't have to scrutinize every point to entry because they are honest and have billed you fairly and you've gotten good results and you've gotten bills that are within the budget that was discussed or if there's an exception that's been flagged for you so i think those relationships are really important and go a long way on both sides to creating reasonableness and trust. Whereas if it's a bunch of one-offs, you've never worked together, you're never going to work together again, you don't have that trust component. And, and I'll talk about that in a second, but I think that's really key. Um, so I think long-term relationships are a good way to manage costs because you can have candid discussion. Both sides are invested in the relationships you're more willing to give. We're, we're willing to give uh, more of a discount to a long-term client uh, that's in a particularly difficult period because we want and value that relationship. And it's harder with someone brand new that we just don't have the track record with. Let's check on the polling results and then we'll turn to alternative fees for our last uh, discussion. Let's see how many of you are using alternative fees and, and at what rate. And we'll, I'll advance the slide as well while that's coming up here. All right, the results are in. Um, and not a lot. So it looks like the, the but overwhelmingly most popular result is zero to 25%. So um, we got uh, in really small numbers. No one's using, one person's using it for over 75% of their uh, work. And really only eight of you are using it for more than a quarter of your work. So that's interesting uh, to me. And, and not that surprising because we are seeing that. So even though there's been an uptick, uh, the billable model certainly is the billable hour model certainly still the dominant mode that's especially true in my area which is litigation we can probably close out that that polling result now thank you jordan so this is one of my favorite cartoons i actually got special permission to use this in my powerpoint from the artist uh, joe stein um but it, it it hit me as a lawyer uh looking at it and for those of you that may have trouble reading uh the the print i know maybe small on your monitor uh the lawyer sitting there on the examination table um, saying, give it to me straight, Doc. How many more billable hours do I have left? Um, and, and I think I thought it was funny because in the law firm environment, um, I, it is something that everyone is focused on billable hours. And I know many of you worked in law firms before going in-house, so you experienced that firsthand. Um, but I do think that that is a driver, right? In law firms, ours is no exception, track billable hours. You get a report every month. Uh, how many billable hours you have. You've got an annual goal for billable hours. Um, so it is something that all lawyers are focused on. And I think it's important to remember because it does create a climate where there's an emphasis on billable hours. Um, you know, and I think that's even more true today in the area of uncertainty uh, with COVID. Um, people are worried about billable hours, particularly uh, associates and other you know, staff attorneys and other people who are worried about job reductions, law firms are making some cuts. Um, they're making cuts for people that don't have enough work to do. And the way we determine who has work to do is looking at those billable hours. So sometimes you feel like you're constantly in search of billable hours. Now, 
that can be good because it means you're out trying to get work, right? We all, we all want valuable work and new work from clients, but it can create distortions and lead to some inefficiencies because if you have, um, you know, a lawyer that is just being graded on their billable hours, it creates some incentives to overbill. Um, and, and I think we just need to be upfront and honest about there is some incentive. If you've got an associate who's trying to meet their 150 or 180 hour a month uh, quota, they're gonna have incentive to work a little extra long uh, on that brief or spend more time uh, reviewing those documents uh, than might be ideal from an efficiency standpoint. Um, now, and I'm not talking about fraudulent hours. There are a small number of lawyers that I think, you know, may just make up hours and fabricate timesheets. Um, you know, some of those have been disciplined by the uh, North Carolina State Bar, as they should be. Um, I think at the reputable firms you guys are using, I think the number of people that are fabricating hours, I would hope and expect is very, very small, right? That's dishonest. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a violation of the rules of professional conduct. I don't think people are doing that. I'm not talking about just writing down work you didn't do. I'm talking about the incentive that you have if you're an associate sitting at home in COVID and you've got a billable target to say, I'm gonna work a little longer on this, particularly if you're light on work. Um, and I think, you know, recognizing that, I think to me, you know, goes to this trust equation. And, you know, I think this is, I, I, oh, I think, let me go back so you can see it, I moved too quickly. So, um, you know, I think here, the, the trust equation really um, balances three uh, factors. At the top, things, you have things that build trust. So credibility, and reliability, and intimacy. Um, credibility is, do you say what you're going to do? Are you honest and forthright? Do you have credibility? Reliability is, are you doing what you say when you said you'd do it? If you say, Mark, get that extension of time or give me the brief two days before it's due, am I reliable and am I doing that? And intimacy is not any kind of uh, physical intimacy. Intimacy is really knowing and understanding the other person's challenges and problems. Do I understand what you're going through as an in-house counsel? Do I understand the pressure the business is putting on you to get this case resolved? And I think when you combine those things, you create trust. If I do what I say I'm gonna do, I'm on time, I'm reliable, I'm answering your messages, I'm giving you the information you need, and I've conveyed I really understand what issues you're facing, that helps build trust and helps build that trust relationship. The thing on the bottom side of the equation that detracts from trust is self-orientation. So if, if you're thinking, Mark doesn't care about me, all he cares about is meeting his billable hour quota, um, that detracts from trust. If you say, Mark doesn't care about the budget crunch I'm facing, he just cares about making his rate as high as possible, that detracts from trust. Um, and I think trust is really important in the relationship between inside counsel and outside counsel. You should not be using lawyers that you don't trust. And, and I don't want to work with clients that don't trust me to do what's in their best interest. I've got a obligation under the rules, but also a fundamental moral obligation to represent you well and to do what is in your best interest. And so I think one of the ways I look at this billable hour issue is it tends to, because of that incentive, if you're just billing hours, um, it tends to diminish trust, which is inefficient um, and generally a bad, a bad thing. So what, what can we do? We, we want to try to promote alignment. We, we want alignment between the client and the lawyer. That's how we're going to move things. Uh, th that's how we're going to move things forward. Um, so, um, and, and I think there are some things that, that can be um, productive there. One thing I hear over and over again is we want predictable fees. Tell me how much it's going to be. Even if it's going to be high, I want to know ahead of time. Because the last thing I want to do is go into the CFO's office or the CEO's office and say, we are over budget. I thought this was going to cost 100000 this month, and it cost me 150000 That's bad. And that is bad for me and you, right? You're going to get yelled at. Your job performance is going to suffer. You're going to get a negative. A surprise is not good. So in-house lawyers say over and over again, make it predictable. And alternative fees are a way to get there. Um, here are some of the benefits that in-house counsel listed around different kinds of alternative fees. Risk sharing is that where we've got skin in the game. 
And again, a contingency fee might be a classic example of that. If you're suing someone for a million dollars and I say, don't worry about billable hours, I'll take a third of whatever you get, um, all of a sudden we have skin in the game. Our, our interests are aligned. I want to win um, as every bit as much as you do because what we win, we share. And so you've got that alignment and that promotes trust too because you're going to be trusting I do what I need to do, but it also creates incentive on me to manage costs, right? It doesn't make, I want to do what I need to do to win the case, but it doesn't make sense to have my associate um, bill extra hours that are unnecessary to the case. Um, it can promote efficiency because if an alternative fee structure, let's say it's a flat fee, I've got a lot of incentive to manage the case efficiently. If you're billing, if you're going to give me $50,000 a month to handle the litigation, now I've got a real incentive to make sure my guys are not overworking, that the lowest uh, uh, timekeeper that can do the work has the work. It really creates that incentive where now it's in my interest, my self-interest, to be efficient. Um, they do tend to produce cost savings and cost predictability. Again, under a good alternative fee arrangement, part of that structure is you know what you're going to have to pay. Um, these are numbers. They're a little old. I went yesterday to try to see if BTI had uh, new numbers, but they've stopped surveying council on alternative fee arrangements. So from 2012 to 2015, you saw a significant uptake in terms of the spend. Uh, I'm wondering if it's continued based on the Charlotte survey that we just did. It looks like it's still under 25% for most of you. So maybe it's flattened out or even gone the other direction. Uh, but certainly for, you know, and again, some of this is, you know, eight, five to eight years old, uh, but there definitely was a trend in using more uh, alternative fee arrangements. Um, and, and again, this was a more recent uh, ACC survey. I think this is 2019. Um, half the in-house lawyers said they thought the use of alternative fees would increase. So that would suggest that people are still thinking about it, still think they're going to become more, more popular. Um, so I think that is, you know, an interesting statistic, and I do think there are reasons to do it. I wanted to spend the last few minutes giving you um, some real life examples. And Jordan, we can remove that poll. I can't tell if it's blocking everyone's view. I know for on my slide, it's um, uh, I'm still seeing the poll. Let me see. No, hopefully that's, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, now it's not. Now, I, um, so let, I wanted to talk about a few alternative fee arrangements we actually use at Womble that I think offer some good cost savings. So I want to start with the transactional area. I think often it is easier um, to have uh, transactional uh, fees done because the work can be um, easier. Now, again, I'm not complicated deals and other stuff are every bit as involved as big litigation. So I'm not, <laughs> not at all casting aspersions on the transactional side. It is super complex, but sometimes it can be done more routinely. You know, one thing that people don't always think about with alternative fees are um, actually having a supplemental uh, uh, general counsel or assistant general counsel. So this is more like a, um, you know, a, someone that is placed, a secondment um, is something that you may be more familiar with, but that really is an alternative fee. Typically, that's done on a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, generally at much lower than a regular billable rate where you say, hey, uh, Womble, we're in a crunch right now. We have someone gone out on leave. Uh, we have someone we just lost and it's going to take some time to replace us. Can you give us someone with experience in our area and just put them in our office for a month or three months and we'll pay a flat rate for it? It's a way to buy time with someone you know is qualified and experienced um, and, you know, without going through the whole hiring process and putting them on your payroll. Um, I think it can be very effective. Law firms have enormous incentive to do that, right? It gives us a look at your inside practices. That person will come back to the firm, really understanding what you do, building that intimacy that promotes trust and a long-term relationship. So it's something we've done and are certainly open to. Um, you can also do flat fee engagements for certain types of transactional work. Um, and we've started to see this. I mentioned deals. I was interested to learn that in Europe, most deals are done on a fixed price basis, often a percentage of the transaction. Uh, much like investment bankers have been using fixed prices for a long time to price their end of the deal. Um, so, you know, and now that we're a transatlantic firm, we're experiencing that in the UK where the, those deal attorneys are pricing it on a flat basis. And we can do that. We've done that now for some deals in the US. Um, I think it's a creative option to just say, we're going to give you a percentage of the cost of the deal. You're going to do all the normal diligence uh, and transactional work. And that way, you know, with certainty 
uh, what that amount is going to be, and you get a lot of those incentive advantages that we talked about. Contract review uh, is an area where I think a lot of people use alternative pricing. We certainly do it at Womble, whether it's through Maine Womble or our subsidiary GC Solutions. Um, we offer uh, things where we review contracts on a per document basis, a per page basis, or kind of a subscription basis where you say, look, we're getting in 50, 100 contracts every month. Can we just pay you a monthly amount? You send it to one of your attorneys to review those contracts uh, for us, highlight issues, make revisions. Um, that can be very, very effective uh, and is a good example, I think, of an alternative price that, that works well for both sides. Um, Regulatory is another area. Again, compliance is a hot area these days. We've got some great compliance lawyers. You may not want a full-time compliance person, but you may want to pay either to have someone from Womble join you or just say, look, we've got a lot of compliance questions and issues. Can we just, you know, use your one of your attorneys um, for five hours a week, 10 hours a week, and let's just pay a flat rate. They will be on call to handle these compliance issues or deal with this compliance problem. Um, that's another thing we've done that I think can be very productive. Uh, and regulatory reviews and checkups are often scopable in a way that you can come up with a good scope, what the reviews can involve. Um, and if you have good scope on something, and that's often the problem with complex litigation, but if you can scope it accurately, you should be able to get a flat fee for it and come up with a fee that is fair to both sides and achieve a lot of those uh, savings around fixed pricing. Um, and locking things in. Our IP counsel are doing this too. We've got uh, someone that's serving as basically outside chief patent counsel. They couldn't afford to bring an IP person in all the time. Uh, they wanted someone though that they could send their patents to review. Um, and so that's set up on a monthly uh, or maybe quarterly basis. Um, some of the more routine IP stuff like PTO searches, applications, prosecution are now often being done on flat fee engagements. Um, that again, I think makes sense because you know what you're going to pay. Again, definition's an issue. Most have different schedules depending on the complexity of the patent. So you need to be clear on the scope of that work, but I think it is it is available for fixed fees. And we've even got some litigation before the PTO. One of my partners, Barry Herman, uh, is great at doing some value-based goal-aligned pricing. And what do I mean by those fancy terms? I'm talking about pricing that is really geared towards the value. So it may be a success fee at the end. One thing that Barry's done that I really like is we basically have a budget. And then if we go over budget, you get a major discount, maybe a 30, 40% discount on all hours over budget. So we don't write it off completely because that's a big risk shift to us. But you know that if we're over budget, um, you're going to get a significant write down. And then on the other side, if we're coming under budget, we get some kicker off in the same percentage. And so it creates incentive for us to be under budget disincentive for us to be over, but neither of us are locked into an absolute dollar amount, which is hard in litigation because things do change. But you create this incentive where we're trying to come in as low as we can uh, because we're going to get more money early uh, and less money at the end. And I think that's creative. And it's just one example of, of ways to be creative in litigation. Um, some other things that we've done, again, uh, we, National Coordinating Council, we've done on alternative fee pricing where you just do a flat fee. Um, uh, one client pays us an annual fee to do their National Coordinating Council all over the country. Um, so we have a long history with that client and it's a good relationship, a win-win for everybody. We know what their load will be. It gets adjusted every year, but we just give them a one-year price. Um, uh, consulting can be done on a flat fee basis. We're starting to do some second opinion work where we'll come in, um, and I mentioned that as a separate item, where if you've got your, own, your regular litigation counsel and you say, we'd love another lawyer that has experience to just tell us what they think the case is worth, what our exposure is, you can pay me a flat fee. Uh, I've done some just on a percentage of the amount to come in and give you an independent assessment of the case, basically a second opinion like you'd get from a medical doctor. Um, and even traditional litigation, you know, I've done flat fees. I had one very creative case where it was big, but my client only had $50,000 a month to budget it. And I told him, well, some months are going to be over and I, some are other. And he said, look, Mark, you need to hit my budget. This, and we were taking over for other counsel. He said, if you can do it for $50,000 a month, I can give you the case, but I can't go over. I, I, I'm locked in. And I met with our team and we said, we'll do it. We'll give you, we'll do flat 50% a month. We took a contingency kicker at the end to make sure we could try to come out in a range that worked for us. And it was scary for me. I had some months at 20 and some months at 100. 
And so I'm like, wow, this, you know, and happily I'm in a firm where they work with me and say, you know, we'll make it work. But the client loved it. My bills were one line bills every month, $50,000. I didn't have to worry about a description of what we were doing. He didn't care. He trusted us to handle the case correctly. So we didn't have to worry about a lot of bill review. It was a flat, simple system. And it doesn't work for every case, but I am suggesting there are ways to really make it impactful for you if you can get creative uh, and think about it. So I think we're about out of time. I appreciate your attendance. Uh, we do have a lot of COVID specific resources on our webpage. You can go there. We just published a return to work guide, which has been very popular and is free. Um, if you've got folks coming back to work or thinking about it, you might want to check that out. Um, you got some information about our firm and questions and discussions. And again, uh, Robert, thank you for your comment. I know we're about out of time. If you need to log off, uh, that's fine. I'm happy to stay online for another five or 10 minutes and answer any questions. Um, I'm also happy to continue this dialogue uh, with any of you. Uh, open invitation for you know an off the clock 30 minute chat. Uh, if you want to keep the discussion going, um, you can just give me and shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, I am happy to happy to chat with you about these topics. I know they're interesting. I know they're challenging. Um, and and I, I think it's good to have a really candid uh, open discussion from both perspectives uh, about ways that we can both uh, help each other succeed. So I don't see other questions. So again, thank you all for joining me uh, at this webinar. Best of luck to you as you deal through this COVID crisis. Uh, all right, thinking of all of you, and let's try to get together in person as a community as soon as we can to, to share war stories and advice um, and other information. So thanks again uh, for attending and look forward to talking to you again in the future.